Thanks, Lance. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon. Uh, hopefully I sound good. Do a sound check here. How do I sound? Sound great, Dan. Excellent. All right. So with that, I'm going to take some time today and talk to you about identity assurance uh, and how to prevent robocalling and fraud and be able to do it for every call in your network. <clears throat> so with that, let me just go ahead and jump in. From an agenda perspective, uh, I'll give you a bit of background on the uh, problem set <clears throat> around ID spoofing and robocalling and fraud. Uh, I'll do a quick snapshot of where some uh, countries are on regulatory and legislative initiatives. We'll talk a bit more detail about what identity assurance is. Uh, I'll go through an example of how we address identity assurance with something that we have released called Ribbon Call Trust. That's our solution for identity assurance. And I'll wrap it up with a short summary. And as Lance said, uh, please uh, put questions in as we go. Um, Jamie will be helping me out and we'll be answering questions um, both during the session as well as at the end. All right. So what's going on? Let's actually start with that and start with our gentleman here who's frustrated. <clears throat> so there's robocalling going on, right? We're all getting them. Uh, I, I, hopefully I don't get any during this session, but my phone's been muted. But it, it happens constantly, right? The, the unfortunate part is, uh, even in the U.S. here, where uh, there's a big initiative to stop robocalling, uh, the FCC, the FTC, and the DOJ are all trying to prevent and enforce fines, but there's very little actual results. Uh, the onus is really on the industry to address this because there are only 62 cases prosecuted against people doing fraudulent activities in a 13-year period. So clearly you can see that, that there has to be a better way to do this than letting the government solve this problem. And on the fraud basis, again, some of the numbers here on the right are very large. And, and I'm not going to go through all the details here other than I really want to point out the magnitude. It's a big problem. It's global. The numbers I'm showing you are from 2019. Uh, when we get new numbers, I can certainly update them. But it's a big problem, and it's growing. So where does that leave us? Well, without an identity assurance solution, there is no customer trust in the phone call. And I think we all know that today. So I want to walk through a couple examples to give you a little more definitive idea of what I'm talking about here for both robocalling and fraud. So here we have a network operator <clears throat> with an enterprise customer and uh, and subscribers. So legitimate customers are making phone calls into those enterprises great, perfect world we live in. Le there's also legitimate calls being made to, to you and I on a personal basis. Now, I've identified this as legitimate robocalling, and you might wonder why. And the answer is because there's valid uses of cases for robocalling. For example, a school uh, calling out to all the students uh, at home or to let them know on their mobiles, to let them know that there's school delays or cancellations. That's a form of robocalling. Uh, debt collectors who are allowed to make phone calls to collect debts, or even as is very relevant here in the U.S. today or yesterday, um, you know, political outreach calls. So there's a lot of good things happening. However, what's not known is some bad actor who's spoofing legal or legitimate phone numbers for fraudulent purposes. And so what happens here is those calls come in and there's no way to distinguish them from good calls to bad calls. They look good. Now, my behavior at home is if I see a number I don't know, I stop answering it. But that's really not where we want to be as an industry. So what that does is it tells us we have to solve that problem. The other problem I want to talk about is international rate service fraud. As another example, again, same network operator, enterprise customers, our bad actor hacks into the enterprise's unified communications or PBX and sets up call forwarding to international numbers. And then they advertise those stolen numbers, but they're not telling people they're stolen. They're saying, hey, here's a number you can call for international services, cheap calls, use me. People dial those stolen numbers. The call goes into the uh, enterprise and gets turned back around with call forwarding, goes out through the network operator and out to these international destinations. So the callers are happy because they're getting to make phone calls to where they need and it's cheap. But the reality is the enterprise is the victim here who says, I don't want to pay. I didn't make those calls. And the service provider has to write off the cost of handling those fraudulent calls. 
not a positive result for anybody in the situation, except the bad actors. So as I said, what does this result in? It results for me, I don't answer calls from anyone I don't know. I don't answer calls that come in without calling name. I think most calls are spam today, so I ignore them. I really want somebody to solve this problem for me, right? I want my service provider to do it, right? I want my service provider to tell me ahead of time when a call is bad, so maybe I can make a decision on my own, or conversely, tell me when it's good. <clears throat> so where does that leave us? In the industry today, there are point solutions being deployed to solve some of these problems. But we believe that there's a need for a much more comprehensive solution that can solve this problem and solve it across multiple uh, problem sets, not just individual point solutions. All right. So I want to do a quick update, as I said, on the regulatory and legislative efforts, and then we'll move on from In the U.S., stir shaken is a solution that's been mandated, and that's to address caller identification spoofing. So I've highlighted a couple key dates here. So on March 31st of this year, it was an FCC order, and that order basically mandated that if you're an IP-based originating or terminating carrier, you have to implement stir shaken by June 30th of 2021. But there was also recognition that for a lot of the smaller or more rural operators, that will not be feasible. So operators with less than 100,000 subscribers have been given a, a, a two-year extension. Sorry, I jumped to the next bottom one. They had a one-year extension on March 31st. On September 29th, uh, a second order was issued by the FCC, and now those smaller operators now have a two-year extension. Um, the other couple things I want to identify here on September 29th is that Stir Shaken now applies to all voice service providers, including over-the-top providers. So people need to understand whatever services they're selling for voice services, how they're going to be able to implement, to attest calls, sign and verify calls as part of Stir Shaken. Um, the other thing I think it's important to point out, and we'll talk about why later, is there's currently no requirement to implement uh, Stir Shaken with TDM or non-IP or TDM networks. It's because there isn't a solution that's been defined to do this. There is industry work to address this. There are multiple solutions having been proposed, including one by us, <clears throat> involving reusing SS7 signaling to carry stir shaken information across TDM networks. But be aware if you have TDM networks that you're terminating traffic on or originating traffic or more importantly using for interconnect services, stir shaken doesn't apply, not by the regulatory mandates. Um, however, um, it's also important to understand if you're carrying, if you're an intermediate network provider carrying traffic, you're also now obligated to make sure that stir shaking information is carried across your network, and you have to participate in traceback methods. So the FCC keeps opening up the rules and trying to expand this and cover more traffic, which I can't, guess is, you know, in the big picture is the right thing to do because the more traffic that's covered, the more chances are that caller ID will not be spoofed. Okay, moving on to the bigger picture, if you will. Um, in the U.S., the top 14 carriers, and I think that's probably a bigger number now, uh, representing about 75% of the calls, are already covered um, under stir shaken. In Canada, uh, which is the other major country that's pursuing stir shaken, right, mandates have been uh, proposed, and <clears throat> originally there was a ruling that had it uh, stir shaken to be implemented uh, this year, that's now been pushed out to align with the same date, the FCC, of June 30th, 2021. But again, there's implementations have already started, and actually a first cross-border stir shaking call was made where actually information was passed between Canada and the U.S. all the way back at the end of 2019. But stir shaking doesn't apply everywhere in the world, although there's interest, right? Australia is more focused on robocalls and fraud. Singapore is, is writing their own requirements for robocall mitigation. <clears throat> um, the UK, France, uh, the UAE, Saudi, they're all in looking at, at options. They're looking at options for stir shaken within their country. They're looking at how they sign calls for calls that are interconnected between countries. There's just a lot of activity going on. And the important part that I want to leave you with before I move on is 
This is a global problem. Different countries have different regulations. Different operators will have different obligations in different countries. But solving this problem and coming up with solutions that work is, is an industry problem across the, the, uh, the globe. And that's where our head is really at and what we're trying to focus on. All right, that, let me go ahead and move on and talk a bit more about identity assurance. So the first thing I want to say is, while stir shaking is getting a lot of attention to prevent caller ID spoofing, it's not a complete identity assurance solution, right? It can be used to vouch for the validity of a caller's identity, but it does not address a caller's intent or reputation. I'm going to go through a bit more detail on what we mean by that because we believe those are critical to get to an identity assurance solution. So these are the three categories. Identity, who's the originator? Stir Shaken's part of that solution. Reputation, is this someone I want to talk to, right? I want someone to tell me that this is a good caller or bad call based on knowing what that reputation of that caller is. And trust context, where did this call originate? I'll go into a bit more detail on that in a, in a bit to explain why that's so critical. Okay, so let's take a look at each of these in a bit more detail. <clears throat> Determining caller identity. Got a caller on the left, an individual on the left making a call. What's their identity, right? They may be a known subscriber. So I'm the originating network. It's a known subscriber to me. It's, I know who that is. That's legitimate. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell somebody that. That's part of Star Shaking, right? If calls are received in a network and you can match them up against do not originate lists, for example, the IRS has a call center number that will never originate calls, right? Or you can match it up against an unassigned number, right? Those are never valid. If you can match it up against <clears throat> actually invalid national numbers, whatever nation you're in and whatever dialing, um, plan you have. So in the U.S., it, we know what invalid E-164 numbers look like. And those are screened out. They're screened out at call processing time. So those should never go through and, and be valid. And then there's store shaking, which, as I said, is, is intended to prevent caller ID spoofing. So the idea of call shaking, we'll get into this in more detail, is to sign a call to attest the identity of the originator and then allow the terminating side to verify that. And so Stir shaking is an important part, but it's not the only way to determine caller identity. Let's talk about reputation and trust context. So on the top, again, I've got a call being made, and I want to know what's the reputation. Well, fundamentally, what is reputation? I'll use the example um, that today, if you have a credit card in the U.S., you've probably heard about a FICO score. Right? What is your reputation as a credit card user? This is the equivalent of that. Okay, So how does that know? What's your credit rating with today? And in this case, what's your reputation rating? Well, you need analytics to do this. You need to be able to understand the, the patterns from calls, from that number, where they're going, where they're terminating, how long they're on, et cetera, et cetera. Analytics can provide that. And, and I'll talk more about how we do that to detect patterns of robocalls and fraud. There's also third-party databases, right, that are either crowdsourced or provided by a network operator, and those databases can be used to identify bad actors. Just, it's a, it's a straight-up matching algorithm, right? So the reason why rep, it's so important to get this right is fundamentally, if reputation is tied to your identity, you want to be able to get the reputation right. If you screw this up, and say a call should be bad when it's good and vice versa, it's going to cause problems in the network. So reputation is really important. Getting it right is equally important. Trust context. As I said, this is where is a call coming from. So if a call is entering my network and I'm trying to figure out what I need to know about that call to terminate it properly, is it coming in from a known subscriber on an originating interface? So a call can originate in my network and terminate in my network. Check the box, it's trusted. That's the green line. Is it a known number to me? It's one of my subscribers, I'm a mobile operator, but they're roaming. So it's coming in on a peering interface. Chances are that's good. It might be spoofed, 
but it's my subscriber and they're roaming and I've never had an issue with the subscriber. But again, it's not possible, it's not impossible that that could be a spoof number. Is the call a local number to my network but coming in on a peering interface? Well, that can't be right. And, and that's certainly been a spoofed call. Um, we had uh, a, uh, an analytics exercise we did with a, an operator. Uh, I'll keep names out of it for the moment, but they found 15% of the calls coming into their network from outside the country were carrying local numbers from inside the country. Just 15% of their calls were spoofed calls. That's a tremendous problem that needs to be addressed. All right. So if I have that information, what do I really need to do to build an identity assurance solution? What I want to be able to do is, is build a solution that's going to determine identity, intent, and reputation, and it needs to have some structure that we believe looks like this. So on the left, the key input is understanding the network. Where is the call taking place? I just alluded to this when I talked about trust context. So how do I get network information into my identity assurance solution. Moving over to the right on the top, you need the ability to leverage transactional policy information. This, this means you've got access to real-time data. So as an example, Stir Shaken provides attestation from the originator saying, I attest that this is a valid originating caller ID. We want to be able to pull that information in real time as part of an identity assurance solution. That's one example, there's more of those. Below that, we have learned policy, which means I'm looking at data and determining the behavior based on machine learning models. Again, how do I get that information? How do I use it? What do I do with it? I'll talk a bit more about that. And lastly, the solution needs to have access to third-party data because no single network operator has all the data they need and no single solution will have all the data available internally. And so again, I'll talk more about why this is important and how we've address this requirement. So with that, what does an identity assurance solution look like? What are some of the key attributes? Right? I've kind of alluded to some of these. I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So the first one is an open ecosystem designed with clearly defined APIs which re are required to provide the flexibility to ingest queries from multiple sources and data from multiple sources. Without an open ecosystem built on standard APIs, right? this just doesn't work. It, it becomes a closed system and it, it just isn't going to, it isn't going to provide the results. Plain and simple, we figure this out. The second is analytics based on machine learning, right? So we're looking at solutions that say, I need both configurable machine learning models as well as models that have learned behavior. I need to be able to take advantage of cloud native design, and web scale processing to be able to do analytics at extremely high volumes, the kind of volumes that we would see at tier one network operator levels. And, and I need to be able to do that at scale, but with extremely low latency, um, because I'm making these decisions about identity and I'm giving information to the terminating service provider in real time. So I've got open ecosystem analytics, I've got cloud native functionality that I'm leveraging, and what am I getting out of this? I'm getting a digital fingerprint. I'm getting enough information about the caller's identity, intent, and reputation that when taken together, we can say, I have a view of this caller, the calls they make, and I have enough information to provide value, valuable feedback on what to do with this call. So it's not just getting information in, it's actually getting information back to a, a network operator to say, hey, here's what we think you should do, or here's information about this call. You can make your own decision based on your own policy management. It's pretty complicated stuff. We think we've got it figured out though. So with that, let me go ahead and talk about Ribbon Call Trust, which is our uh, complete identity assurance solution that we built based on those pillars I've just talked about and the attributes I've just described. So let me start with Stir Shaken. All right? Our call trust solution encompasses our in-network Stir Shaken solution. So we have built and added features on our session border controllers, our gateways, our policy servers, our call controllers, 
the capability to support stir shaking in a service provider's network. We've also developed a stir shaking compliant secure telephone identity product, which is the part of stir shaking that actually provides the caller identification, authentication, signing, and verification services. So all of these products together, right, enable a service provider to implement stir shaking in their network, and we have customers doing this today. I talked about how analytics is important for a call trust or identity assurance solution. So for us, our ribbon call trust leverages insights that it gets from our ribbon analytics solution. So I, I mentioned this when I talked about trust context. I mentioned it when I talked about um, modeling for reputation scoring. The importance of analytics is that in what I show here on the left is network elements can provide call detail records, and operational measurements into an analytics solution where we can use our security applications to detect traffic patterns that indicate robocaller fraud. And we have the ability to identify if specific calls are coming from a suspect originator. What's more important though is not that we have this ability inside a single network operator, but we have this ability to pass this information up to Ribbon Identity Hub which I'll talk about in a moment, which integrates this information into our overall identity assurance solution. The importance, again, is I have visibility in a solution that pulls information from a network and provides valuable information about a caller ID, a caller's intent and reputation. And we have customers using analytics in production today. Um, you might ask, can this work with other third-party analytics? And the answer is, yes, it could. Will we get the same information from them as we get from our own solution? That would be remain to be determined. But I'll show you why it would work with a third-party analytics as well in a bit. The next part of Ribbon Call Trust is hosted services to mitigate robocalls and fraud. So Ribbon hosts identity assurance services. We have two of them today. We're, we're bringing more to the table as we go. Uh, for reputation scoring and for stir shaking as a service. So the first service is the one on the left, reputation scoring, and is providing real-time multi-dimensional scoring to classify good or bad calls. It sounds simple, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes to do that, right? We're leveraging multiple data sources to increase the accuracy of our scoring. I told you before, reputation, you got to get it right. Um, and we need it because it gives us the ability to significantly provide value to a, ter a terminating network provider on how, what are their options? What's the best way they should, they should terminate this call? And again, we have the ability to give them that information. They can make their own policy decisions or we can give them policy decisions that we think are the right answers. Very flexible solution. The second service on the right is stir shaken as a service. So I already mentioned that we provide stir shaken as to, that can be deployed within a, net, a service provider's network. We also provide the ability to provide our complete stir shaking solution, which is the authentication, signing, verification, and in addition, the certificate repository services from a ribbon hosted solution, which means a network operator can implement stir shaking to meet their regulatory requirements, but do it as an operating expense. They can essentially send queries into us we respond with the information they need for signing or for verification. So I want to reiterate that both of these services are hosted services from Ribbon, and we offer them on a subscription basis. And again, as I said, this is just the first two of a suite of services or a portfolio we anticipate offering for identity assurance. Okay, I mentioned Identity Hub, so I want to go into that in a bit more information. So our hosted services are enabled by Identity Hub. <clears throat> so Identity Hub is a cloud-native software-as-a-service platform. It's shown here receiving client requests and sending back responses. So those queries that come into the Ribbon Identity Hub, based on whichever service is, is being requested, so uh, somebody could buy Stir Shaken as a service, somebody could buy Reputation Scoring, they could in fact buy both. Um, clients will send requests in, they'll get responses back. So Stir Shaken 
they might get the verification information back. On um, reputation scoring, they'll get back, again, multiple reputation scores associated with a given call. <clears throat> the other thing I want to point out, as I show on the bottom here, is analytics going up to uh, our cloud identity database, feeding in fraud information. Again, um, as I, I will show you, this could be a, somebody else's analytics solution, just the same. On the top right, we've got all these third-party databases I referenced earlier. And we also have our ribbon um, managed network operation center, managing the hosted services on a 24 by 7 basis. I want to point out though that, and let me go back a slide because it's important, everything I show here on this left hand side is all IP based, SBCs and PSXs and, and soft switching, but it works for TDM as well. <clears throat> so we believe it's critically important that service providers who are terminating traffic on TDM switches have the ability to also get reputation scoring information. Is this call a good call? Without actually changing anything in the network, right? Calls coming in from the PSTN, right? All switches can already do AIN triggers to do lookups and things like that. We're suggesting that they can do AIN triggers a uh, call will go up through an SCP gateway, which will then, again, send a request in. I'd like reputation scoring on this particular call. Here's the information about the call. Information comes back. Again, that information can be passed back, and AIN terminating triggers can be used to provide valuable information for how a call should be handled. We think it's really important that this not be limited to just IP, but it works for both TDM and IP switches. And, um, and we're hearing from a lot of customers that this is exactly what they think is important. Okay, so I've talked about Ribbon Identity Hub and how it uh, underpins our services set. I think uh, a couple points I want to bring to the table uh, have to do with Ribbon Innovation and why some of the things we've done are important. And if you're going to look at uh, investments in identity assurance services, again, hosted services through us as an example, um, you should be confident that those services are underpinned by some really smart decisions that make it viable as a solution for you as a service provider, or make it viable for you as a service provider to ensure you're delivering the best possible results to your end customers, whether they are enterprises or, or individual uh, subscribers. <clears throat> So I want to start with this picture. This is just focusing on Identity Hub, but I've blown it up a bit more. I've added in a little more information here, right? Uh, you see in here on the left, these requests and responses are coming in to something called a service graph. You see APIs being designated on, on services, including an API going out on fraud information. And so I want to touch on five points on the next five slides. Cloud native design, machine learning models, open APIs and data integration, uh, continuous synthetic monitoring, and security and privacy. Um, we, we believe that all of those things are really important, and without them, uh, a solution isn't going to deliver the kind of results that are expected from our customers, and ultimately they are in customers. Okay, um, so we never had a doubt, even from the beginning as we started designing this, that the only way we were going to do this was to be going cloud native and taking advantage of uh, public cloud infrastructure that is built and excels at web scale processing and, and the dynamic nature of how they do resource allocations. Um, I will tell people right now, so our choice for this is AWS. Um, <clears throat> we chose AWS not only because we needed the scale and performance that they have, but we needed to be able to leverage the kinds of capabilities they offer to be able to do our services, in this case, Stroh Shake and Reputation Scoring, that run at tier one operator call volumes, right? Massive call volumes of potential queries on every call in real time that needed responses within 50 milliseconds because we're in the call flow, right? So we, we, we wanted to take advantage of public cloud infrastructure, again, I'm not going to compare Amazon versus Google or Microsoft or anybody else, and we have options certainly to do that. 
but um, we went with Amazon as a market leader and we're really confident that that's been the right choice so far. Um, second point around low latency of real-time scoring for calls is that we want to be able to make sure that the response time for any given query is as quick as possible so we place the processing that needs to take place as close as possible to the customer. Right? So this allows, this basically says our identity hub services are hosted in multiple Amazon region, regions based on our customer demand. We also needed to ensure service uptime through high availability schema that were designed in how we deploy the solution. So we can deploy clusters in multiple regions and each cluster can be deployed within multiple availability zones inside AWS. Again, I, I cannot emphasize enough, we'll be in the call path. A call will be coming in, a query will be made, is this a call I want to terminate? How do I want to terminate it? We need to make sure we're delivering that at extremely high reliability and availability requirements. And again, obviously, with very low latency. So cloud native design is how we took advantage of that. <clears throat> uh, machine learning models, right? How do we adapt to changing traffic? So on the left, you can see here I've got, in this case, I'm just showing SBCs or gateways or call control, policy servers. Again, third-party databases are our, our third parties uh, equipment or our equipment, doesn't matter. What they're producing is network data, call detail records, KPIs. <clears throat> and we want to be able to take that data in near real time into Ribbon Analytics, where we're using machine learning models to continuously learn about this network traffic, detecting patterns, identifying potential fraud attempts. It's a continuous learning model because this traffic that comes in from the left to the right is continuously changing. But patterns can be detected. So what do we do next? We feed those patterns as well as pulling in the third party data sources right, into Identity Hub. So whether those third-party data sources, as I mentioned, are provided by the network operator themselves or the third-party crowdsourced or their industry databases, doesn't matter. More data, better chances of being more accurate in your assessments. <clears throat> so now I've got fraud insights, third-party data coming into Identity Hub, where I'm now doing continuous modeling in my identity hub, it, um, uh, what's the right word, um, instantiation. So again, I have configurable models that I can build things that I know are things I need to look at. I also have behavioral learning models. My end goal is to be able to do inference and proper predictions. That is, what is this call? Is this good? Should it be good? Should it be bad? What is that digital fingerprint? which ultimately says when a reputation request comes in, I'm able to turn around in my less than 50 milliseconds and provide a reputation score. There is a tremendous amount of processing going on behind the scenes to make all of this happen. And as I said, all of this is running in a public cloud, cloud native design model. Open APIs and data integration. So again, same picture here on the right, <clears throat> but what does this mean? What, is, what does it really mean to be open and have multiple data source integrations? Well, for starters, we've built everything on a REST API. We will publish the API interface. It's non proprietary In other words, we're not, we're not limiting this to I can only take data from anything I know, right? Our purpose is to be open and open this up to anybody for both real-time and non-real-time data. So I want queries to come in on this open API. I want data sources to come in on open APIs. I need an open ecosystem. It won't work without an open ecosystem. We've never expected it would. We've designed it to be able to do this. <clears throat> Furthermore, that API service graph that I show here um, has been built to give us the flexibility to coordinate multiple data sources, in other words, doing, uh, doing dips into other data that we've received, and pulling that together and coordinating that with a single request so that I can turn around and give a single reply. As far as data integration goes, 
The other thing about APIs is they're adaptable. So I can augment the API to address new threats. I can add new types of API. I can add new types of data sources to an API. And if I need to amend that API to pick up something unique, I can do that, right? And I can publish it. I can update it, right? So the idea here is that, that I've got a solution that's been built for flexibility and adaptability and openness in order that I, as the hosted service provider, can provide the best possible result back to my customer and they in turn to their end customers. <clears throat> All right, continuous synthetic monitoring to meet service level agreements, right? So we're looking at five nines availability and under 50 millisecond latency for 99% of those re um, responses that we're sending back for our nuisance and our fraud scores. Um, it's possible we could have a really complex query and it might take a little longer, but if we can hit that number of under 50 milliseconds on an overwhelming majority of our calls, we will solve the need for our customers to have this in real time and not add any post dial delay. So how do we do this? Well, let's start with CSM, our continuous synthetic monitoring. So every minute we're running traffic representing reputation scoring requests. Identity Hub is processing those requests, calculating reputation scores, and sending responses back. The CSM, our continuous synthetic monitoring, gets that information back and then feeds data about the traffic it's handling over to Amazon CloudWatch. So we can get information about the aggregate numbers, we can get information about the average time it took, we can get total. We, it, it's a slew of information. I'm not going to try and go into the details. But the point is, we are using Amazon's CloudWatch, which is built for cloud native uh, monitoring, and driving that information from CloudWatch into another Lambda application for monitoring. So we are now running synthetic traffic and a monitoring solution that's built to understand what is the, the behavior going on inside Identity Hub. Are we delivering what we need for our customers? And on the right, I show a sample GUI, uh, which is being used at our Managed Network Operations Center for 24 by 7 monitoring. So we can know whether or not we're hitting our service level objectives. We can troubleshoot. We can identify issues and solve them before they happen. <clears throat> right? Identity Hub is still up here, still handling all the customer's traffic as it normally is. What we're doing, though, is we're getting a benchmark with our continuous monitoring to make sure we're meeting those obligations. This cannot be done if we weren't using these cloud native designs and these tools from Amazon. Security and data privacy designed in from day one. So last but not least, I want to talk about this and what we've done. We understand the importance of data privacy um, and the ability to protect data privacy. So we have programs in place to meet uh, GDPR, which is the, uh, the big initiative uh, out of Europe, but it applies, it even applies to, to, to Ribbon here in the U.S. Um, if we're looking at traffic that may be related to something happening in Europe. So my point is, it's not a European thing we're doing, it's a privacy thing. We've, we've got data, we've got policies in place to handle data movement, data retention, data subject rights. Again, if anyone wants more information, we can certainly talk about that. In more detail. Um, we need to be able to secure the data itself, right? So we've looked, and you can read this slide, uh, I don't need to read it to you, but we've looked at multiple aspects for handling the data both at rest and, and when it's moving and making sure that the data is continuously uh, secure to the point where we don't believe we're at any risk of someone getting in and getting access to this data that's going back and forth in our system. Operational security. Again, as a hosted service provider, we need to make sure that our operational security is robust and we're meeting uh, industry obligations. So ISO 27001 is one of those. It has in place the obligations you have to meet to ensure that you are providing operational security. So we have that in place. We know how we would deal with a data breach event. Um, you know, we know how 
we need to implement roles-based access solution, two-factor authentication, and security audits, and all the things that you would expect us to do on the service we're running on behalf of our customers and in turn their end customers. And finally, uh, again, another thing we leverage from AWS, uh, and, and we're certainly not unique, they do this as, as an offered service, is their well-architected review. They will walk people through, and in this case, our solution, through their well-architected review, giving guidance and direction, and in fact, in some cases, mandates for what are the best practices that have to be implemented to deliver a solution that runs on Amazon and doesn't break any of their obligations as the cloud infrastructure provider, right? Providing the, the baseline that we run on top of. So it's, it's, I cannot emphasize enough, it's been designed in from day one. All right, so with that, I've gone through a lot of information. I want to uh, try and summarize this and uh, we'll leave a little bit of time here uh, for questions. And <clears throat> Okay, so I started with uh, identity assurance and I said stir shaken. We have a solution in place that addresses stir shaken that can be deployed uh, in a customer's network. We have a holistic solution that we believe is important for being able to incrementally also determine intent and reputation. Without that, we don't believe you can properly mitigate robocalls and fraud. Um, we offer Identity Hub services. Uh, these are our Identity Assurance services for Search Aiken and for reputation scoring, as I said, the first of many to come, all of it enabled by our cloud-native SaaS platform. And again, I just went through a lot of information about how that is leveraging cloud native design, built for high volume processing, millisecond response times, open APIs, uh, network wide analytics that we get from, from our solution or any other analytic solution. And again, driving a solution that we ultimately believe is more than what point solutions can deliver today. So with that, I've wrapped it up. I will uh, I'll turn to Jamie and ask him, do we have any questions that have come in that we can answer? Uh, Jamie, are you there? You're on mute. I, I am here, Dan. So I think we have one, a couple we've been able to address with the, uh, uh, through the chat. Um, we did have one just come in. I was working on an answer for it, but maybe I'll let you answer this live. Um, and that is the, the fraud scores and reputation data that we're providing to service providers. Um, will we make that available for public access? So enterprises, let's say, who are you know, generating calls can understand the ratings that their calls are getting. Okay, so let me take this in two steps. <clears throat> um, where we're starting here today is um, terminating calls. So a call will come to a service provider who's going, in this example, to hand that call to an enterprise customer, we are going to be, we, as a hosted service provider, will be providing reputation scores to that service provider to enable them to properly terminate those calls. So for example, if it's a known call it shouldn't be coming through, they can block it. Should they block it? That depends on their relationship with the enterprise, but again, our, our conversations, enterprises don't want fraudulent calls coming in, right? They want to avoid those. The call may be a good call and just pick, it's passed right on through. The call may be questionable, right? What should I do with this? Can I route this? Should I route calls that have questionable scores <clears throat> over to uh, a bit bucket or a, a voicemail system or um, even a voice capture where they'll get a recording that says, please enter the following digits. And if it's a machine making robocalls, they're not going to do that. Um, those call those reputation scores right now are not passed on to the enterprise. However, the the bigger goal, because identity assurance is not simply just for a service provider, but that is clearly the, the starting point, would be to be able to provide these to enterprises, right? Um, and give them information on the calls they are receiving so they can have a negotiation, if you will, with their service provider. I do expect service providers to negotiate and to have a dialogue with their enterprise customers that say, let's understand the benchmarks of 
if I get a call and it's a, a 50 percent percentile score, do you want me to pass it through? The answer is probably not. Do you want me to pass it through if it's 85 percent? Yes, but let's categorize that. And so we have the option to be very flexible in our termination. So I don't, I don't I see us passing the calls directly. This, sorry, sorry, Jamie. I don't see us passing the scores all the way to the enterprise customer directly, but that certainly is possible in the future. Yeah, and I, I think the question was more around if you are the owner of the number of originating calls that are getting blocked, um, how do you how do you do that? And I, in in practice, what we've seen is our customers who have implemented Call Trust have public uh, published phone numbers that and that you can call if you are um, getting your calls um, blocked by that service provider or they're not routing. Um, and certainly you can handle that through the service provider. So so this solution that we offer is you know, is a service to our customers that are service providers. Um, and in if individual, you know, um, uh, call center or enterprise is finding that their calls are getting blocked or not terminating properly, um, then those concerns or questions will be taken up with the service providers themselves. And, and, and I guess I'll, it, it's worth p perhaps taking a side uh, track here, which we did not discuss. So we talked about stir shaking and about service providers being able to uh, attest to a call. There are conversations between service providers and enterprises that are ongoing today. In fact, uh, work going on in the industry bodies as to how service providers can attest calls on behalf of their enterprise customers. So I know the enterprise owns these numbers, even though they're using multiple numbers to make outbound calls, they're all legit, and I'm going to attest that on their behalf. So there's a lot of information um, that we can get into on, on another side discussion for whoever asked that, um, and that's being worked on in the industry as well. And I think that will go a long way to making sure that calls aren't being blocked uh, when they shouldn't be blocked. But again, that's just part of the solution. Then there was another question talking about um, dealing with latency. Um, in this particular example, the customer is in the uh, far north part of Canada. Um, they can call over, you know, a satellite connection, maybe thousands of fiber miles um, to a, to another location, uh, you know, perhaps Ontario in Canada. And how do we deal with the latency of getting back to AWS on that call? And 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 I think the answer, specific, you know, re really is we have to look at the individual call flows. And um, keep in mind, we're not necessarily invoking call trust on the originating side for that call. It would be on the terminating leg. Um, so in the case where the origination and the termination are both um, you know, in the far north of Canada and the data center is, is further away, then yeah, that perhaps that could be a, a challenge. And that's something we just have to look at. Um, where does the closest Amazon location um, to keep the post odds delay down to a minimum? But but certainly in the very far extreme satellite connection networks, you know, maybe that's not going to be possible. And if there isn't, so so the the question raises a good point, and I, I will make it clear. Uh, maybe I, I should have done that earlier. The 50 millisecond response is us providing a reputation score or a stir shaken first stat response if we're providing that as a service back to the entity doing the query so that we don't add any undue burden to the call. If there is inherent network latency because of where the call is originating, how it's being handled and terminated, that's out of our domain, right? We want to just make sure that the added piece that we're putting in is not an undue burden and in, in fact ensures that there's, there's no noticeable change by using our solution. Right, and that may be a use case where you want to have the STI server on premise so that you're not using it for, for signing the calls via the service, right? So, so certainly for signing calls, that's why we offer it both on-prem for the service provider as well as a hosted service. Um, you know, that could be a solution to, to speed that up. Um, I think that was the going back through the list i think we i answered either privately or to all all the other questions that we had come in dan i think there was some questions actually there's one here around a multi-vendor so we talk about our solution for um sip and tdm and we show 
said you were you referenced um, the PSX and some other I think these are they mean ribbon products um, what about multi vendor networks so uh, as a as a let me start with the first part <clears throat> as a as a open ecosystem with a, with a published rest API uh, if a somebody else's policy solution wants to send a query into us so they can get policy information back so they can direct calls for routing or call handling that'll work with us right it's not just a, a has to be a ribbon policy server if uh, it's uh, third-party session border controllers uh, and gateways and call controllers who are producing call detail records uh, we can take those feeds into our ribbon analytics solution um, I do anticipate we will be pulling traffic from other analytics solutions in networks uh, in the future. Uh, the API would allow that. Um, we believe we have uh, some uh, intellectual property and, and some value add for our ribbon analytics today deployed in, in service provider networks. Um, and we'd certainly like to leverage those opportunities, but we're not restricting it to has to be ribbon analytics. Um, that's a decision again made by a service provider. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to think the, from a multi-vendor perspective, you know, uh, again, we're agnostic on the data ingestion side from the databases. So that's certainly not something that, that we're, uh, that's ribbon provided necessarily. Does that help? Yep, I think, I think you uh, answered the question. That is all the questions that came through in the chat. Again, if you have um, have questions, please um, submit them through the chat. We'll be happy to answer them. So I want to reiterate um, what Lance said at the very beginning. Um, we do have some handouts. Um, I know it's a lot to absorb in, in uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, I often like to, to pull down and read some of the solution briefs. So that's what we've provided. We've provided a number of solution briefs. Uh, that uh, would allow you to, you know, read on your own time. Please do. Uh, please certainly follow up with uh, with us if you have questions. We we do believe we have something uh, unique to offer, and we are we we want to engage people. So that's where we're at today. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. So let's take a moment uh, just to wrap up here. Um, we will be getting an email out to everyone later today with. Uh, uh, replay link. Uh, we had a couple people ask about that, so we have recorded this session, and you'll get a link to that, as well as the slides. Um, you know, you'll have those available too. So look for an email uh, later this afternoon for those two things. And um, we haven't seen any more questions come in, so I think that we'll uh, we'll just we'll just go ahead and close out for today. Please do uh, go to ribbon.com. Obviously, if questions come up later, you can reply to any of the emails we send you today. You can also find us at ribbon.com, rbbn.com, uh, and you can find us there, contact us forums, other places you can connect. So thanks again for your time today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, we look forward to having you all on the next uh, webinar shortly down the road. Take care and have a great day. Thank you.